And welcome back. How you got now, guys? Today we've got a huge guest. <laughs> I'm super excited. I'm sure the guys are too. We've got oh, yeah. Spencer Garrett. You may know him from Once Upon a Time in Ho Hollywood and uh, Air Force One and 218 other things. That's impressive. That is very impressive. Makes me, very, makes me feel very, very old, but uh, <laughs> I'm just getting started, guys. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, like, okay, your acting career is prestigious, to say the least. You've done so much stuff. Yeah, it's it's very sparse as well. Like, you're not all, like, you know those actors who get caught in one role and they play that role for yeah. the rest of their life? Like, whether it be, like, the same actual role or just similar roles to that? You've, uh, you. It seems you've avoided that kind of. Way I've of tried to. I've tried to. I've tried. I've tried to get a lot of diversity, mm. uh, and tried to do every different kind of role that I that I can get my hands on. Frankly, I mean, when I first started out, for the first maybe fifteen years of my career, I was sort of, uh, I was sort of put in this box of, uh, you know, you're you are the uh, you're the go to. Uh, you know, yuppie prick in a suit. So I became the, uh, I was like the go-to asshole lawyer. Uh, like in Yes Man. I, I was, I was the, I was the go-to uh, corrupt congressman. A uh, lot of, lot of jerks in suits. And mm -hmm. I had a pretty good run of that for a long time and I got a little tired of it. And fortunately I had, there was a casting director who saw something different in me, uh, who put me in the movie Public Enemies uh, with Johnny Depp. Uh, for Michael Mann and gave me uh, gave me the ability to do something else entirely and that kind of changed my career that was in 2007 I think 2008 but uh, you know I've tried to mix it up as much as I can between film and television and theater to do as many things as I can I've been very lucky yeah yeah we've talked to a lot of people who've been uh, what's it called uh, typecasted for certain roles and that, that they was never me. enjoyed that was me. That's what I meant by being put in a box. I was typecast. I was I was seen uh, in a certain light by uh, by casting directors. <laughs> that oh, this guy's yeah. really good at doing this one thing, and I wasn't able myself to kind of break out of that box. Uh, and I and I tried, but it wasn't really until this casting director uh, gave me an opportunity to do something else. I mean, I'd done lots of other things in between, um, but that particular movie sort of changed the trajectory of my of my career so so speaking of your career i want to ask you a bit about how it started um what was your first role as an actor and what made you want to get into acting my first role as an actor i would probably say uh i didn't have a lot to do but when i was when i was eight years old uh my mom was in a film my mom's an actor uh she still is an actor. She's 87. She's still doing it. She's been Kathleen acting Nolan since she was two years old. Her name is Kathleen Nolan. You can Google her. She was uh, first woman president of uh, Kathleen Nolan, by the way, doesn't get much more Irish than that. She was the first woman president of the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. And she was uh, in, what's that thing called again? Magnum P.I. Uh, she was in Magnum P.I. and like 500 other television shows. She started out in on Broadway in the 1950s and and. Uh, did a, a long-running television series here called The Real McCoys. Uh, got a couple of Emmy nominations. And so I grew up, there she is. There's my mom. <laughs> in in various, various stages of her life. Um, so yeah, so I, she was doing a movie in 1973 called Limbo, uh, which was, uh, as far as I'm concerned, sort of the, uh, the, first, the first movie about Vietnam. Uh, it was about wives of POWs, and uh, and I got a little role. I had a, a couple of lines in that movie, and that that uh, that was my first speaking role in a movie. And I think I had a couple of lines. I think they paid me fifty dollars cash in an envelope, and I went out and bought toys with it. Um, <laughs> and that was sort of that sort of gave me the taste, uh, you know, for for being. But I grew up on sets. I grew up backstage and on sets most of my life as a kid, but that being in that movie sort of gave me a taste for, uh, you know, for, for being on a film set and, and really just really enjoying it. And, uh, and then probably the next thing I did, 
I was uh, 10. My mom was directing a film for the American Film Institute. Uh, and it was me and Laura Dern. I don't know if you can find a picture in there. I don't think it, one exists online, but myself and Laura Dern, Laura's mother, Diane Ladd, Martin Sheen. Uh, it was a little short film for the American Film Institute. And I had a larger role then. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm pretty good at this. And I did a lot of little stuff like that when I was a kid. And then I took a long, long break in between, between being a little kid and then high school. And I didn't really start going back into acting in earnest until, uh, until I got out of college. And so when I was about 23, 24, there's Laura, my lovely friend. We grew up together. Um, I've known Laura since we are, since we're, I'm like nine years old. She's had an extraordinary career. Um, but yeah, I didn't really start at this in earnest, uh, thinking this is something I wanted to do for a living for good, uh, until I was about 22, 23, when I went to New York and I started studying. But I always had, I always had the bug is what I meant to say. I mean, I always had the bug, my... My grandparents ran a showboat uh, called the Goldenrod. It was like one of those, if you see, one of those paddle wheel boats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ever, and it had a theater on it. Oh. And uh, they raised my mom and my aunt. Uh, and they lived on the boat. And they did plays and musicals on the showboat. And, P and they, the boat would go up and down the Mississippi River. And people would stop. People from the little towns would stop and get on the boat. And they would do plays. So that's part of my, that's part of my history. That's my, that's what's in my blood. So when you ask me, uh, Gerard, what you know, what made me want to be an actor? I think it was, it was kind of a no-brainer for me when I decided this is what I wanted to do because I just, I wanted to kind of carry on the, the family business, the family tradition. I'm an only child. I have no brothers and sisters, and I have just a proud history of, uh, you know, of theater in my family. So I decided. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot at this. I moved out to L.A. from New York in 1989, and I've been, I've been going ever since. I respect it. Yeah, carrying on the family line of work. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Are, yeah. Um, I know uh, my, my, uh, what I started to really get some traction. Uh, my grandparents were still alive, uh, and they were, you know, they were around long enough to see me start to get work as an actor, uh, which was very satisfying to me. And um, uh, my mom is still acting. She's, like I said, she's 87. She actually did uh, the last film uh, with Burt Reynolds. She played Burt Reynolds' wife, his last film performance, a movie called The Last Movie Star uh, that came out uh, two years ago, I think. That was his last film. He was supposed to be in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but he was, he was cast in the role that Bruce Dern did. Uh, and, uh, and he passed away suddenly and Bruce Dern, uh, took over for him, but yeah, there he is. Another, another, another pal of mine, a legend, a dear friend, definitely a legend, legend for sure. And, uh, and he and mom came up together. This, uh, wonderful director, Adam Rifkin, uh, wrote the role with my mom in mind and, um, he found a clip of my mom and Burt Reynolds from an old episode of Gunsmoke in the late 1950s. And he called me up and he said, I have this clip from back then and the character that you're, I want your mother to play is an actress. And her character and Burt Reynolds' character met on the set of a television show and I need to use your mother. Oh, there they are. There's Adam. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful director. Uh, anyway. I, uh, my mom hadn't worked in several years and I, I gave her the script and I said, I think you should really do this. And so she was reunited with her old friend for the last time, which was very sweet. So, um, I'm, I'm blessed to have a lot of stories like that in my life. So, uh, mom is, mom is still active and still working and, um, you know, she's, uh, she's happy every time, every time her son gets another gig cause it keeps me off the streets. Yeah. <laughs> That's sure. That picture in the. In my upper left, with her in the red coat uh, and the red hair, uh, that is at the premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival of The Last Movie Star. Oh, wow. There she is. Yeah, that's two years ago. Oh, wow. That's cool. She looks Irish, doesn't she? Oh, yeah. Very Irish. 100%. <laughs> she looks like she's about to beat the shy of me with a wooden spoon for not eating my veggies. <laughs> that's a very Irish thing. Uh, 
Now, well, what I do normally, or what we do normally when there's an actor, I go through basically one by one with their acting credits. But I don't think you <laughs> yeah. have there enough time to do no all of that. There is no I way. I mean, so, we could try. We get like a, we say this, you say that, one kind of sentence thing. But sure. No, no, <laughs> do it for a couple, no. Even that would take a couple hours. Um, I just want to ask you about... Wanted to go, if you wanted to scroll down through my IMDb, I could, I could tell you which of the ones that were maybe a little bit more memorable to talk about than some of the others. But, uh, I mean, I have my favorites. I don't like, I don't want to, I don't want to play favorites, but I have my favorite gigs that I've worked on, things that impacted me in a certain way or things that meant, uh, meant a lot to me at a certain time in my life, obviously, Air, you know, Air Force One and public enemies, yeah. but, uh, but you know, fire away guys. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going anywhere. We're locked down here too. So <laughs> I'd love to ask you about your favorite ones, but that's not fair. Of course. Um, so what I'll ask about is your unique experiences on different movies or different TV shows as well. Yeah. So Air Force One, that was a big one for you. So what was unique about that movie? What, what kind of crazy stuff went on there? Harrison Ford, like? Not a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, for me, uh, it was the experience of, of getting cast in that film was was really wonderful. Uh, my memory of it is I had really wanted to, ever since uh, having seen the movie Das Boot, uh, great German film directed by Wolfgang Peterson, I remember thinking that I'd always wanted to work with him. And I was not on the radar of the people that cast. Uh, uh, there's a, there was a wonderful casting director named Jane Jenkins, and she cast all of Ron Howard's movies and all of uh, all of Rob Reiner's films, major, major casting director at the time, cast Apollo 13 and, you know, all, all of the great Ron Howard films. Uh, and they were the go-to casting directors. They were the, they were the people that could really kick you into the next level. And I had always wanted to get into that office and I never could. And finally I did. And I went and I had an interview with them. And back then, back in the day, actors had their, what they call their demo reel. And it was on a VHS cassette tape. And I went in and I interviewed with Jane Jenkins. She ended up showing my, my demo reel, which at that point in 1994, I think when we shot the film, uh, I'd had several credits. I'd done a fair amount of stuff. So I had a, a decent little body of work behind me. And I certainly had a lot of guys, guys in suits, guys that you know, looked like they belonged in Washington, D.C. And uh, she showed my tape to Wolfgang. And uh, I went up. They were in the middle of shooting the film, and I drove up to this location where they were filming. And the production assistant grabbed Wolfgang and pulled him off the set to, to meet me because they hadn't cast this role yet. And he came up to me, and he sort of looked me up and down. And I had my, my full Washington, D.C., you know, suit and tie with my little American flag pin. And he just looked at me, and he said, I saw your tape was very, very good. He said, I like the suit, I like the pin. He said, you look like you're ready to go to work. And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, good. Would you like to be in this film? And I said, I very much would. And he said, good, let's make a movie. And I remember <laughs> driving back in my shitty little car that I had at the time, thinking, oh my God, I'm, I'm actually, I get, to, I get a seat at the grown-ups table. I get to I get to sit at the grown-ups table and, and play with the big boys. And that was the first time I thought, okay, I get to I'm I'm now kind of moved up a notch a little bit. It felt like I'd kind of moved moved up a, a notch up the ladder a little bit. That was a big deal. But there was no craziness on the set. It was I think I was on the film for about three months, and it was me and Glenn Close and that whole gang in the White House situation room that you see all of those scenes. I never met Harrison Ford or Gary Oldman. Uh, until the rap party, um, months later, months, months and months after the film came out, and I actually met Harrison at the rap party, and I went up and introduced myself. I said, hi, we've never met. I'm Spencer. I played Thomas Lee. I was Glenn Close's assistant, and, uh, and he carried this box around with him, and he opened it up. He's like, he said, oh, it's great to meet you. He's, you want to smoke a joint? <laughs> Now, I'm not telling tales out of school. He was sort of known for that. And I thought, you know, when Han Solo offers you a joint, 
What are you going to do? So he had different. I don't even know what to say about it. There were like different <clears throat> kinds of weed in this box. And I said, <laughs> I'll take that one. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I didn't know the difference. They all look the same. And he lit it up and I took a hit and I took two puffs off this joint. And I was, I was off to the magic kingdom. I mean, I was toast. <laughs> and I said, did you, uh, did you smoke this during the making of the film? He said, oh yeah. Um, so anyway, that's probably the craziest thing that happened to me within connection with that movie. But uh, uh, yeah, I get, getting high with Harrison Ford was a, uh, a seminal experience. Bro, you <laughs> ruined Indiana Jones for me, man. You don't need like drink like whiskey or something. You wouldn't touch anything else. Come on, nah. Like, you look at uh, the amount of stuff he did in Star Wars. Yeah. Jones, you. Like, no, come on. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's incredible. I mean, he's uh, he's iconic. What is he? Seventy something now. He he still looks yeah. amazing. Um, I think we had someone else tell a story about him before. Did we? They they went to the same school as like his kid. Oh and yeah. He, was, he came over. It was like, uh, he, he was like, "Hello, Mister Ford," and he's like, just kind of brushed him aside and I like, keep going, kid. <laughs> I, I forget. I forget who said that uh, to us. He's a very <laughs> stoic guy he's not a warm and fuzzy guy yeah uh, i mean when you've been in as many iconic films as he has i mean you know you think of all the indiana jones films all the star wars films. i mean he gets bugged a lot i can't imagine that it would be it must be a hell of a lot of fun to be him yeah. uh and and also not you know because i mean i i look at uh i follow mark hamill on twitter for example and the amount of you know crap that he gets from star wars fans all these years later is ridiculous. I mean, he, yeah, he does yeah. seem like a warm and fuzzy guy, though, even with all the stuff he gets. Oh, God, gotcha. who Mark Hamill? I mean, I know yeah. the fact that he, he disagrees does. with it. Yes. I'm yeah. not mad, but he, he seems like a terrific person. I'd love to meet Mark he Hamill. Was, uh, when was it last year that he was in the uh St. Patrick's Day parade here? I didn't know he was in the parade here. Yeah, he was in he was in like a vintage car. He was just sitting in the back of it. And everyone really? was like, holy shit, it's Mark Hamill. <laughs> oh, well, that's cool. Hold on. I, I think, yeah, I'm like, I'm about 90% sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, oh, he yeah. kicked off. Oh, yeah. yeah. In 2018. Yeah, there, yeah. Oh, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, my God. Look... He's, yeah, he looks so cool. Irish as well. Like, he's yeah. well hidden. He does. He does. Paddy Cup, everything, yeah. Uh, he has awesome. the aesthetic so well. Jesus. Got that same hat and that same cap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, one, one, one thing that like really present early on, there, annoys me <laughs> is when people call it St. Patty's Day. Uh, you'll, you'll never hear that oh. from me. I know, it drives me crazy. Thank God. Yeah. Who's Patty? That's very, I think that's more of an American Patrick. thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. it definitely is. It's funny. I was in uh, I was in Chicago, uh, which is a great city, and I was there filming an episode of the show called Chicago PD, up what until uh, up until March. What is St. Patrick's Day? March seventeenth. Yes. And I was there up until the thirteenth, and there were sort of rumblings that things were starting to shut down and the pandemic <laughs> starting to, you know, get a get a hold on this country, and we wrapped. The episode on the 14th, I was on a plane home on the 15th, back to Los Angeles, and everything shut down here that weekend of like the 16th. So uh, um, there's a place, there's a there's a um, a great pub here in Los Angeles called Tom Bergen's. That's a, a legendary place uh, that I usually I always go every St. Patrick's Day. I go and have a pint or two or three sometimes, and uh, and they were you know everything shut down so. Uh, that was uh, that was a, that was a, 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 a sad it was a sad time. I'm 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 hoping I can get back there next March. Hoping this thing will be uh, over. Uh, the, I I have like kind of a similar thing that happened. I remember it was just around when COVID kind of started, and you know, it come up and then I was still in Australia, and then I got back. I think the twelfth, and then the week after that, 
everything started to shut down. And then uh, I my birthday is actually two days after St. Patrick's Day. Oh, yeah? And, uh, yeah. And I was planning on having a party for it, and then I had to cancel that. And then things started to look up here again uh, in, the, in the last few weeks. And I was meant to have my party again on Saturday, this Saturday coming. Oh. And we went back into lockdown. So... This this COVID thing doesn't care what plans you oh. have, it's gonna shut down everything. Doesn't care if you have fucking rights, by the way. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Sorry. You're right. I said COVID doesn't care if you have rights. Doesn't care if you're oh, an American citizen. Doesn't care if by the second, first, third amendment, wear the goddamn mask. Yeah, wear the mask. Yeah, it's true. This is by the way, I just happened to. This is my. Just sitting next to me on my computer, I've got I've got a quite a collection here. Oh, nice. Fair Models. <laughs> Strikes. <laughs> <see you. laughs> Leaving the house. I mean, I'm not I'm not fucking around here. Obviously. That's dedication. Uh, I like it. I respect it. Here's the best one. He, he's got. Everyone needs to follow what Spencer's doing. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I like that one. I like that one a lot. Oh, nice. That's pretty good. Come in peace. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm uh, I'm prepared. I'm actually uh, I'm actually flying uh, to DC tomorrow to uh, uh, my my girlfriend, and uh, so I've got. I mean. Oh wow! Jesus! Oh damn! The whole you know she's like she said I won't let you in my house unless I know you're wearing a face shield and a mask. And I've got goggles somewhere, you know, so it's, it's bananas. Respect. Fucking bananas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's better to be in safe than sorry. Should wear Absolutely. a hazmat suit, give a hug. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, some people that in Florida, right? Uh, wearing a mask is, uh, is maybe uncomfortable, but uh, yeah. being yeah. on a ventilator is a lot more uncomfortable. Oh, 100%. So, I was just thinking there when you were talking about... Uh, your mask you had there, like, how funny would it have been if Thomas said that thing about wear your damn mask and you were against masks? How oh funny God. would that segment have been? <laughs> you got to be an asshole to be against masks. You have to be an idiot oh, to Jesus. be against masks. You'd be very selfish to be against masks. Absolutely. There was an anti-mask uh, protest happening in Ireland. It was, that was on Griffith Street. Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, I could not so believe it happened like, here. You know, people are just like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I don't care if I get it. I'm not wearing my mask. I don't like if it. If I get it, fine. But it's not if you get it. It's yeah. you giving it to other people is the yeah, problem. Yeah. There's Maybe a great ad some on, people don't want to get it. A great ad that's running on CNN. It's very simple, and it's like a picture of a mask, and you know, it says, uh, it says, this is a mask. This is not a political statement. This is a mask. Period. It's just that simple. That's it. But a, t a lot of things going on in the states at the moment. Things, everything's a political opinion. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah. Some people don't believe in the virus, but we'll move we'll, we'll move on from that. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Well, well, it is the five G guys. It is five. It's five G sure. towers, Thomas. It's obvious. Yeah, it is pretty obvious. I mean, if no. you look into it deep enough. No. Your Wi-Fi connection is the reason. I mean, as soon as you're born, you you turn on Wi-Fi, right? No, stay you, with me here for a second. Yeah, tell, right? tell oh, you yeah. one thing. <laughs> tell you one thing. I put I got a fiber box installed in my house, and the next day I had a cold. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. I I, I <laughs> agree that it's nothing but uh, nothing a coincidence, Dara. I think. Up, Thomas, sorry. This Moving is on. America. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I apologize. Things like this window uh, too. So you remember what, what do you think this virus so, is real? Thomas. <laughs> Thomas. Thomas. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about some of the things you've done more recently during the coronavirus outbreak. You were involved in quarantine, the TV series. I was. I helped create a, a funny, weird little show uh, back in March, mid-March, uh, an actor friend of mine reached out to me and he said, I came up with this idea to keep us all busy and to, to keep us from going batshit crazy during this thing. Um, I came up with this idea of having a bunch of actors, a bunch of out-of-work actors from a, from a fictitious soap opera 
and they are interacting with each other on Zoom, staying in touch with each other because all of the cast has been sidelined because the entire industry is shut down. And all of the cast members from the soap opera are checking in with each other on Zoom. And it turns out that their lives are just as messy and complicated and sexy and fun as they are on the soap opera and that their real lives kind of mirror the soap opera. And he asked me to come on board as an actor to play the patriarch of this fictitious soap called Chino Hills, which is a, a bedroom community of Los Angeles, a wealthy bedroom community. And I said, sure, I'd love to. Um, I'm a producer, I produce several things. And I said, look, let me come on board as a producer and let me help shape it and come up with the storylines and let me help you find some of the actors. And so I did, and before I knew it, within days we had a, an, an incredible cast of a uh, very, very diverse group of actors from all ages uh, to play these soap opera characters. And we came up with this storyline. We thought we would do maybe five, ten episodes, because none of us back in March thought that this thing was going to go on as long as it did. So we thought, okay, we'll do this until as long as the pandemic lasts. Little did we know, you know, here we, here we are six months later. Um, but we started shooting this show called Quarantine, a Zoom story. And we had two, uh, we had actually three directors in their homes with their computers filming the other actors in their homes on Zoom. And we would film the scenes and uh, Jerry Ying, who is my actor friend who uh, came up with this idea uh, to, he would guide the actors. We call it sort of guided improv. And they would guide the actors through the scenes because you can't edit on Zoom. So yeah. we would do 25, 30 takes of each scene until he felt like we got it right. And um, the whole idea, the whole premise behind it was to raise money. Uh, there's an organization here called the SAG-AFTRA Foundation, the Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, SAG-AFTRA, which is the Actors Union, uh, they, have a, uh, a, they have a fund that raises money, the COVID-19 relief fund. So we did it to raise money for actors in need. Um, years ago, 10 years ago, there was a writer's strike here in Los Angeles. The writer's union, uh, the WGA, was on strike. And I was out of work for about six, five, six months. And I went to the foundation and they... Uh, gave me a loan of uh, of ten thousand dollars so I could you know help stay afloat. So this was our way of giving back and you know to raise money for actors in need. Little did we know that we would keep going with this thing. We did twenty five episodes of it, and when word got out that we were doing it and how popular it got, people wanted to jump on board and join us. So um, I don't know if you guys are hip to uh, a guy named Randy Rainbow who is a, a huge internet sensation here. You could look him up. Randy Rainbow is, he does political parodies sung to the tune of Broadway show tunes. He rewrites Broadway show tunes and, and basically does these uh, parodies of, of the administration. And uh, hugely popular, incredibly funny. There he is. Uh, and you should watch one of his videos one time. You'll get a kick out of it. You'll, get, you'll go down a rabbit hole and you'll want to watch a lot of them. So Randy is a friend and a fan of the show. And so Randy agreed to join us. Uh, Steven Weber, Willie Garson, Rob Morrow from Northern Exposure. We had great, great, uh, well-known actors that wanted to join us. Um, Brie Larson, who's a, 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 a marvelous actress from the show Grimm, she came on to play the role of my girlfriend to do one episode. She ended up staying on as a regular. Uh, so we ended up doing 25 episodes, raising a lot of money for the SAG Foundation and for actors. And it was, it's one of the most gratifying things I've ever done to date. We ended it about uh, a month ago. There's Bree. That's, yeah, uh, Turner. I'm sorry, Bree Turner. I'm sorry, not Bree Turner. Larson. Turner. No, that's kind Bree of Turner. Turner. Yes. Yeah, it was like, I was just about to I was go. Like, you, you said that with, as if it was nothing. Captain no. Marvel, right. No, 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 no. <laughs> Brie Larson's, Brie Larson's wonderful. Academy Award winner. Uh, would have been great to have her as well. But there's Brie Turner, extraordinary actress. And she, uh, so my character, Marty, uh, the patriarch of this show, uh, his agent leaves him. The show is shut down. Everything's turned to shit. Everybody's in lockdown. So I decide to uh, 
uh, I decide to uh, to start an acting class online on Zoom, and Bree Turner uh, comes comes into my acting class on Zoom, and uh, it turns out she's kind of a stalker. She's a huge super fan of my character and the show, the soap opera, and she ends up stalking me, but I end up falling in love with her, and we end up, the season finale, we end up getting married at the end. You guys can watch it. I mean, it's on Instagram. It's on uh, Quarantine. Zoom? We got married over Zoom. We had a wedding <laughs> on Zoom. Finale episode, all Amazing. 12 cast members, there was a band, and the last episode, you, you can see it, you can find it on uh, uh, at Quarantine the Show on Instagram. We're on Instagram TV. Each episode is like six minutes long, between six and eight minutes long. And uh, you can watch the entire series in an hour and a half. And yeah, we actually had a wedding on Zoom. That's amazing. Uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty amazing. I'm, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the show. It kind of reminds me of what David Tennant did pretty recently, staged. That was him and... He's amazing. Yeah, he did it with the BBC. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I seen some of that with my parents, and that was really cool. Just just when you were talking about over Zoom, it's it's amazing how creative people have gotten now. Oh yeah, and like even when we we can't be around each other on set and stuff, that they're still making shows by any means. You know what? Like. I I had never heard of Zoom before we did this show. I mean, I I think I'd heard of it, but I'd never used it. I really had no idea, and I had no idea how. Uh, I had no idea. Oh, I got a call coming in, and you guys just went away. And here we go. And we're back. Sorry. Um, I uh, I really didn't know what Zoom was, and I didn't realize how creative you could be with the medium. We were actually the first show. It was a Screen Actors Guild contract. Uh, all of the actors worked for free. They donated their time. Uh, they didn't take a penny, and we were the only show going. Uh, during the pandemic that was sanctioned by the Screen Actors Guild, by, by the union. Um, since then, there have been so many other shows that have evolved on Zoom. There's going to be a couple of shows on television that have been greenlit by some studios that, are, that take place on Zoom. So I like to think that we kind of set the precedent. We kind of like laid the groundwork for it. But it's a, it's a lot of fun. We're very proud of it. It's very different, like... like I mean, I'm going to check it out after this, like... Check it out. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Uh, go on. Quarant it quarantine the show on IGTV, and go scroll to the bottom, and you can watch the pilot episode, and you can also see how the show evolved. Like we got better and better and better at what we were doing over the course of the weeks and months. Uh, we would set aside all of the actors set aside Fridays and Saturdays because it took several hours to film. You know, one little one little five minute scene could take you know three hours to film. And so they all set aside their time and the, the, the evolution of the show and the quality of the show got more sophisticated. And as we became more familiar with the medium and how we could use it and tweak it to our, you know, to our purposes, it got, you know, it got a lot better. And so by the time you see the, fu the finale episode and what Jerry and the directors were able to do, uh, it's pretty impressive. I was, I'm, I'm still impressed by, you know, I, wa I rewatched the series, uh, the other night just for the fun of it. And I was like, wow, we really made a good thing. It's really terrific. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> the thing awesome. that like, <clears throat> yeah, before all this, like no one ever would, if someone said to you, oh yeah, Hey, like there's this calling platform called zoom and you can have a bunch of different people in it, and it's yeah. usually used for business conferences. But uh, there's going to be a TV show made on it. People will be like, yeah. are you crazy? But Barry, yeah. the same thing could be said with this. We're doing a podcast yeah, over Skype. Yeah, definitely. Like, before... Like, uh, interview, but like, it, it, obviously, obviously started it this done, during quarantine. Well. Obviously, it had been done before with this, though. But, like, the... Right. The absurd amount of podcasts that have been created just because people, you know they were in quarantine they're like oh yeah I, I like to flex my creative muscles and try yeah. and get something done you know yeah. i know the three yeah. of us uh, were all we we're just like cooped up and i know jared jared's an archer and he couldn't do archery and both of them just uh they actually couldn't finish school because of covid and uh 
I just got back from Australia, so I wasn't really doing anything. And the three of us all decided we were like, hey, Jared actually put out a tweet, and uh, he was like, think yes, anyone, uh, anyone, and uh, like uh, me and Thomas both just texted back, we're like, we're in, and uh, yeah. that's how it started. Yeah, started the same day. Amazing, that's good amazing. idea, guys. Thank you. Oh, I uh, disagree. Thank you so Great much. idea. <laughs> How much should have? <laughs> you, guys, you guys are good at it. You've got a knack for it. I it's not easy so to do. Uh, well, it's gotten like we're how many episodes? We're ninety two or three episodes. This is ninety three. Ninety three in today. Really? And, uh, wow. Yeah, it's been every day for the last three months. Ninety three days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, to uh, besides uh, worldwide international superstar such as myself. Uh, <laughs> Have you, have you spoke? Who else have you guys talked to? Um, well, we've talked to a good few people, like uh, uh, Steve Bastoni from The Matrix. Uh, we talked to James C. Burns from Black Ops. Also, he's yeah. also an actor. He's Charles very good Baker. actor as well. Charles, Charles Baker, Baker, who would have been in Breaking Bad, Skinny Pete. Oh yeah. sure. Oh Charles yeah. Baker. Yeah, yeah. Charles Baker. I'm... We would have talked to leading paleontologist Jack Corner, who they based Alan Grant off in Jurassic Park. The base and, character. and the book as well. He based the character of Alan Grant off Jack Horner. Jack Horner and wants just, to bring back the dinosaurs. We have, we have and he's so pretty many, close to us. We have uh, so many. Stitch Duran. Oh, Stitch Duran. Yeah. Stitch Duran. Yeah. The cut man for all the boxing. He does the, he does the cut, cut for yeah, Tyson Fury and he did it for the Clint Skills for years. We've had a lot of local celebrities like uh, Hardy Books. The Hardy Books. Hardy Books. Oh, yeah. They're like, they're like comedians and stuff. In Ireland, yeah. They're huge in Ireland. Like, oh, yeah, we've, we've had so many different people on that. It's it's just crazy. Like, the amount of stuff that we're learning, I don't think half, half of the stuff we can't process it as we learn it. Because like, yeah, we, we've, we've got had, 70 guests we've, on. Yeah, in we've so. had 70 guests on. We've had, like, uh, Olympians. We've had ninja warriors, actors, comedians, everything. Like, it's just people from all different walks of life and all different professions. And, like, That's amazing. It's crazy, yeah. Good for you guys. That's so cool. And I love the fact that you've got you got Google right here. I think I one of the one of the podcasts I did uh, with uh, these chaps in Scotland a while back. They had they had uh, they were googling. They were doing the same thing. They were sort of googling me as they went along. You know, digging into my background, and uh, it's amazing what you can what you can discover. Yeah, it's 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 yeah. like it's very helpful. Like when we're yeah. researching, like. Uh, on actors and stuff, IMDb is just so handy, and yeah. uh, just speaking like, of like existing knowledge, but it does obviously, make... yeah, of course, of course. But uh, I actually I wanted to mention there because we had that little Brie Larson mishap. Uh, in the MC. It's in that you were in uh you were in Iron Man three, was it? I was. Yeah. Yeah. You Can were um it? you were the Rose Hill Sheriff, right? I was the Rose Hill Sheriff. I was originally cast. Uh, uh, it's a, a, an odd story, but I was originally cast as the president. Oh, um, oh no way. Yeah, I got cast as the president, and at the last minute, and I was ready to go, my bags were packed, I was heading to Wilmington, North Carolina, and uh, the director, Shane Black, and, and Robert Downey, who's an old pal, and they'd all signed off on me, and I was ready to go. And then uh, one of the big wigs at Marvel decided that he thought I was too baby-faced, I was too young-looking to play the sheriff. <laughs> well, I guess uh, that's a they, kind they of a compliment. They need somebody with more, more uh, oh, oh, there's uh, Stephanie Shostak, who, who stuck her hand through my belly in that movie. Yeah. Uh, Terribly rude, isn't it? Terrible. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean did you get, did you get they, permission they, to do that? Decided I was too young, which is uh, not a bad problem to have when you're an actor in this. <laughs> but, uh, they wanted somebody with more gravitas, and I said, "Well, I said I'll, you know, I said you can make my my hair was a lot darker then. I said, you know, you can make my hair gray and give me wrinkles, whatever you want to do." And they said, "No, no, we needed we need an older actor." And so uh, I I basically I still got paid for the role. But the director called me and he said, look, I want you to be in this movie. I'm sorry that that happened. And, uh, you know, so will you come and play with us? And it's a fun little scene. So I was actually there. I was there for six weeks in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is a beautiful little town, a little seaside town in North Carolina. And uh, I was there for six weeks and I worked 
uh, one day, one or two days, I think. So not a bad gig to have. It was a nice little summer vacation. I would have preferred to have had the, the more meaty, juicy part of the president, but uh, I still got to be in the movie. And, uh, and, you know, and it plays all over the world. <laughs> the residuals, people still come up to me and say, are you the guy that, that got killed by the alien in the bar in Iron Man 3 out of all the things <laughs> to get recognized for? Um, the only downside is that Marvel has a rule that once you're in one Marvel project, once you're, if you're recognizable in any way, that's it for you. You can't be, I can't be in any other Marvel. So I couldn't have done any of the Avengers stuff or Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Ah, or any yeah. of the shows. So that, I was, that must have came about after, um, what was it? The, uh, who was that? Star-Lord's Ma in Guardians of the Galaxy. She was actually in uh, Captain America, the first one, uh -huh. before that. Yeah. And people started forming this whole thing. Like she was, it was literally like she just asked Captain America for a photo. Uh -huh. And uh, then after that, she was Peter Crow's mom. And then people were like, hold, hold on a minute. Like it's just. Probably. That might be how it started. But the casting director, uh, yeah, Sarah Finn, who does all of the Marvel stuff, uh, they basically had a rule that said, you know, you can't do any other Mar Marvel things. So that's a bummer. That's a shame. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was a bummer. I mean, you are dead now, though, in that universe. So, <laughs> technically, or am I? Or am oh, I? Oh, oh, or am I'll have to wait and oh. see. I suppose. <laughs> we're waiting. We're waiting for the. We're waiting for the sequel, the spinoff. Uh, you know, Bar Rose Hill. Sheriff in space. But yeah, no, we're waiting. We're waiting for the spinoff where Rose Hill's Sheriff becomes RoboCop. Bingo. <laughs> exactly. I like the yeah. way you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was, I just thought of that because we were talking. We were talking yesterday about like the best uh, movie cyborgs and movie robots, and RoboCop came up, and I was just like, "Hold on!" So like, you know, sheriff gets punched in the stomach straight through, and uh, you know, that's that's a pretty. Which may I say that RoboCop isn't the best movie robot? Let me just get that in. Robocop first is the best. Oh no, movie. it's it's no 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 no. I, oh no, I believe you are so story, wrong. I believe. I believe the the two, uh, me and Thomas and our guest that we had on yesterday, I believe we agreed that it was the T-1000. Oh, wait, no, Thomas. Thomas. You guys ever watch Short Circuit? No, shut yeah, up. Yeah, Short Circuit was oh, very good. It's great. The T-1000 is pretty amazing. I mean, you, you know, you can't, you can't compare them. They're all, they're all pretty amazing. Yeah, T -1000 Thomas, is Thomas my likes Rocky this one. <laughs> you ever guys see robots? Yeah, yeah. It's the guy. It's the guy who like, controls the gate with the keys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's such a dick. Yeah, he's he controls Tim. That's it. <laughs> My guy Patrick was the T one thousand, but I, I uh, <laughs> RoboCop. There's a wonderful actor. Actually, speaking of Chicago PD, wonderful actor named Paul McCrane, uh, who you recognize from a million things in film and television. Um, he is now a, a very well-known director, and he was directing me in the episode of Chicago PD when the pandemic hit and we shut down. Oh, wow. And we were on the set, we were talking about, there he is. So he was in RoboCop, and we were talking about RoboCop on the set. And uh, I'm part of a group, uh, for the last couple of years, there's a group of, of actors, we call ourselves the CADS, which is the Character Actors Dining Society. And uh, if you go on my Instagram page, you can see a, there's a picture, a couple of pictures of us. But it's me, uh, Paul McCrane, uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld, Lawrence Fishburne, Stephen Weber, uh, Richard Kind, Titus Welliver, who's on the show Bosch, LeVar Burton, Eric McCormick from Will and Grace, uh, Michael McKeon. It's a great group of actors. And we sit around and we just shoot the shit and talk about, you know, Hollywood history and film history and... Uh, but Paul has got a lot of great stories, mm. so uh, Sorry, it's so funny that, that yeah, that RoboCop came up. I think I've seen a couple of videos like that. They do they do like um, chatting with comedians. I saw a big one where there was like it was Jim Carrey and Sasha Baron Cohen and yeah. all these dudes that are just that hilarious. Yeah. You know, that that sounds really interesting. Yeah, it is. It does sound really interesting. Yeah, that it's was a good it's a good group of guys. It's a really uh, I mean, we usually in in more normal times. We would go out to dinner. We have dinner once a month, and we would sit around. Oh, Alfred Molina. Uh, Alfred Molina is the, the president of the CADS. He sort of started the group. 
And uh, so we go to dinner. We sit around the we sit around the dinner table and we drink wine and you know, shoot the shit and tell stories. And you know, it's all about the crack. It's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> So very Irish of you again. But now we do it on Zoom <laughs> every Monday night. There's Fred. Great. Oh, one of the greatest, gosh. one of the greatest it's character sad. actors, one of the greatest uh, men I've, I've known. Lovely man. And possibly the best Spider-Man villain. <laughs> Doc Ock. Yep. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, it's just like, what was I going to say? Yeah, think, Dara, think. Think, we just, come on. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> say Somebody. something. Okay, I'll say Dara, something. Are you, um, um, is, Dara, uh -huh. is, D Daly is a pretty, is a fairly common Irish name, yeah? It is, yeah. It I is. like to think so, anyway. Well, any, uh, anytime you go into any, like, souvenir shops or anything with the second name things that you can get, it's all yeah. up there, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you know who, t you know Tim Daly, Timothy Daly? I... Don't sadly. You can look him up. So Tim Daly uh, <laughs> was on a show, uh, many many shows, uh, probably most notably Wings, um, a sitcom back in the eighties and nineties. But uh, Tim and I worked together on, uh, and that's his sister there uh, on his right in the picture, Tyne Daly, also uh, an amazing, uh, amazing uh, brother sister actors. Uh, and Tim and I worked on uh, Madam Secretary together, but. Uh, they are they are very very Irish and very proud of their Irishness. Just as a side note, so uh, you're probably you're probably related to them somehow. I mean that would be pretty cool. I mean they yeah. got the same head shape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I gonna say? Um, I don't know if we talked all that much about your connection with Ireland. You were saying to the lads earlier that you often come here. Um, are you do you have Irish heritage or what's the crack? Well, my uh, my grandmother's name was uh, was Kennedy. Her name was Clara Kennedy. Uh, my mom's name is Nolan, and Very she's Irish. named after my great great. So Nolan Kennedy. Uh, I think there's some there's some O'Toole in my lineage, but uh, my great great grandmother came over from Ireland in the 1880s. Um, my grandparents uh, were were you know here in the states. But uh, yeah, but Kennedy O'Toole, uh, my great great aunt was was Nolan, and my mother took her name as her stage name, so she became Kathleen Nolan, and uh, so yeah, and I, I spent uh, as I was telling Dara when we we started out, uh, I spent probably twenty summers every summer for about two weeks. We had a great great American friends here, uh, an extraordinary photographer named Bob Willoughby, uh, who you can also look up, uh, one of the greatest. Uh, movie still photographers of all time. He shot every great film in the 50s through the, for the, through the 80s. He and his family uh, in the 1970s during Watergate and Vietnam, they decided to pack up their family and move away to move out of the States. And they found a castle that was about to be torn down and turned into a hotel uh, in, uh, that's all of Bob's work. That's him on the, on the upper left with the cameras around his neck. But he shot every great star from James Dean to Billy Holiday to Audrey Hepburn. Um, so Bob and his wife and four kids, they moved and they bought this castle in Kilbritton, uh, which is in County Cork, uh, just south of uh, Kinsale. So uh, he and my mom were very close. And so we went over there every summer for, for about 20 years. And it was the, the fondest memories of my life. So I, I spent a lot of time there. And then when we would leave can sail, we would, you know, get in a car and we would drive up and do, you know, Ring of Kerry and all of that every summer yeah. for 20 years. So, oh, there's can sail. Oh, Mike, you're making me, you're making me misty. <laughs> I love it. It is a magic town. It's really great. So, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, very lovely memories of can sail and lovely memories of Ireland. Mm. That's we only have lovely thing. memories of Ireland because we live here. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it's different for you, but. Ah, uh, yeah, well, sure, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, sure, look, everyone has fun. But it, 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 I mean, I, I told Darren. More fun memories of the place Ireland is my, I mean, I know you guys have had, you know, you've been through a lot in the last 20 years, you know, the ups and downs, but um, the Irish people are my favorite people. Uh, the literature, the theater, uh, mm. the poetry, the countryside. I mean, 
maybe I have a more romanticized view of it, but uh, I'm sure, you know, being an outsider, but my experience having gone there and, and spent summers there as a little kid from like from age 10 to age 20 and, you know, and kind of feeling like it was my second home. Uh, it's, yeah. it's very, much a, it's very much a part of my, of my heart. That's a very unique feeling some people have. Sadly, yeah. because we, we're Irish and live in Ireland, we don't get that feeling. I do. No matter where we go, yeah. but we, we've talked to a couple of people and they describe the same feeling of feeling like they're home when they go back to somewhere that's connected to their heritage. Yeah. yeah. Lucky. You're very lucky. Yes, <laughs> even, I, that, yeah, just, even, right. even if you go somewhere that you've spent a long, really long time, like you're, you're going to have a deep connection to that place. So it's a deep myself. connection to road. No, I have a deep know. connection to us. Maybe, I don't know, sure. guys. I, like, I, don't, I don't know if I, I would have the same feeling if yeah. I... I don't know if I'd have the same sentiment or the same feeling if I didn't have the Irish in my in my heritage. Yeah. Right, Maybe yeah, it would be different. Sure. But the fact that, you know, my mother was Nolan and my grandmother was Kennedy. Um, and, you know, they were from they were from Kilkenny uh, on her side of the family. So, you know, we would we went back and we been to the ancestral home and all that. So it's, you know, it was a big deal for me. That's, that's very yeah. cool, man. Uh, yeah. uh, that's very, very cool, man. It's just and like, so what's St. Patrick's been, like at your, at your house? At my house? You guys, you guys go all out? This year, this year it didn't exist, but uh, this is my, um, I spent a lot of time, I lived in New York City for 20 years, and there's a very famous bar called PJ Clark's which has uh, been around in Manhattan, I think, maybe 100 years. It's a classic New York bar, and that was my, when I was in New York City, it was two blocks from my apartment, so everybody would congregate on, uh, you know, in, in PJ Clark's. Yeah. Um, it's a classic old-school New York saloon, uh, and, you know, with the best jukebox in New York City, and so I, my memories of, of St. Patrick's Day were, you know, going to PJ Clark's. And, you know, out here, it's, diff it's difficult. It's uh, difficult. Because everybody, you have to drive to get around in Los Angeles, so it's a little bit, you know, it's it's a little bit tricky now that now that we have Uber, uh, it's a little bit easier to you know have a few have a few pops and get home without any worries. But um, yeah. you know, uh, there there's there's too many crazy drivers out here, so uh, I, I prefer to have my St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll run to the market and get a six pack of Guinness and you know stay home and avoid all the. Uh, as my as my father used to say, the, avoid all the amateur drunks mm. out there. <laughs> Can't handle it. And yes. watch the watch the St. Patrick's Day parade from New York City. Uh, you know, yeah. from the comfort of my couch. <laughs> if, if you combined all the St. Patrick's Day parades in Ireland into one, it would still be smaller than the one mm. that happens in New York. Well, I'm what's, sure. What's, what's the like, name of that The ones place? you guys do put us to shame, and we're and Irish. Yeah, we had a. You guys invented it. I know. Yeah. 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 What, 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 what in Chicago? Have have we well, you know, like the turn of the century, I mean, you know, and during the, the potato famine, yeah. you know, everybody, everybody jumped over here. So there's a, yeah, an enormous... Half, half the population went over to you guys. Half yeah. the population. And then a lot of them went back during the, during the boom, right? I mean, a lot of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I remember a, a, lot of the, a lot of the great bars and restaurants in New York when I was living there 20 years ago, but... You know, PJs and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the bartenders were from Ireland. They'd come over and a lot of the young, a lot of the young kids that came over in their 18s, you know, 18s, their teens and 20s. When things started to get good again, ec economically, they, they, they split and they went back. My family wanted to do the opposite. Uh, we had the deposit on a house. We were going to go over to the States, live there. Uh, so I'd be growing up there. But, um. Because of how insane, uh, I hope there's no offense there with your health system, but how insane it is, they wouldn't be able to afford it. Yeah. So we stayed here. Yeah. So during the boom, we were doing pretty well story? as well. Sorry, no. Wasn't, wasn't there some story uh, a few months back about uh, an old man who got COVID and he stayed in the hospital for like a month or something? And his bill, yeah. I believe, was like 2.6 million or something? I, I, remember, like, yeah, I remember reading that. That guy is in a lot of bother right now. I'd say, yeah, unless, he, unless he set up a GoFundMe. And he was like, se he was like seventy, and like you know, he was he suffered with COVID, and then they were mm. still like, all right, pay up. 
Yeah. And I understand it has to be that way to an extent. 1.1 million, 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 million dollar medical bill. Dollars. Yeah, 1. Point. All Crazy. man beats COVID-19 and gets hit with the If, you, if you get it here and you go to the hospital and they take care of you, you walk out nearly without a bill. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's the whole thing. That's, that's incredible. Crazy. That's incredible. Um, any, you got any more questions? Any, uh, any film or TV questions? Hmm. Which prefer doing? It, if it's, if it's a good script, if the writing is good, uh, it, it doesn't matter to me with, with film. The only difference between film and TV for me is with, with movies, you have the luxury sometimes, uh, of being able to rehearse a week or two before you start the film. Um, which I, I like. I like to kind of, I like to rehearse a, a job and kind of get in the groove and get to know the other actors. Most of the time, you don't have that luxury these days, especially with an independent film where there's a low budget. They can't afford to pay their actors for the time to rehearse. But on a big budget film, like on Air Force One or Public Enemies, I mean, we, were, we rehearsed for three weeks in Chicago. I mean, I took shooting lessons and uh, driving lessons and you know I was the getaway car driver in public enemies I had to learn how to drive that old car so you know you get it there's a little um, a little learning curve with the other actors getting to know the other actors which is always fun with the television show you get you audition on a Monday you get cast on a Tuesday and you could be on the set you know by Thursday after your costume fitting so there's no time for rehearsal so I like to rehearse but either way if the if the writing is good uh, I'm, I'm I'm just psyched to be there yeah. 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 Fair enough. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to check one thing real quick. What was it like working with Tarantino? I think oh. we're yeah, all that, big that, fans of How did we not ask that yet? That's a that's a big deal. We're all re Reservoir yeah. Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Killed Man. Yeah. They're like this guy. He was terrific. <laughs> I I did not meet him uh, until the day I walked onto the set. I auditioned, and I think I found out seven or eight months later. I auditioned for that scene that I have in the film. And I walked out of the audition room feeling like I, I, I did a really nice job. Yeah. And, and I thought, I think I'm probably going to get this. But then I didn't hear anything for about seven or eight months. And I was on my way to New York to do a play. And I called my manager and I said, have we heard anything about that Tarantino film yet? Can you call again and see if I'm still in the running? And I was leaving the next day to do this uh, to do this play. And my manager called me back and he said, I just talked to the casting director. You got it. Your fitting is tomorrow and you start the next day. I mean, it was literally like that fast. If I had gotten the plane to New York, I, they might have found, you know, gotten somebody else. I don't know. Yeah. But um, but I met I met Quentin on the set. I walked onto the set and he knew everything about my career. He knew everything that I'd ever done. Uh, he was referencing things that I had been in. And he knew who my mom was and my family history and all of that. We had a great little catch up. There was no, there was not really any rehearsal. I mean, I walked on and there was Brad and Leo sitting there in the chairs on that Western set. And I sat down and we did maybe two or three takes of, of my, of my close up, And then two or three takes of the, the two guys on the other side of the camera. And I was probably in and out of there in an hour. And he was amazing. I mean, he was, you know, he was great. He said, uh, do one as written and then do one where you can just riff and, and, you know, add to the script, make it up, improvise. So I did. So I did one, I did one take as written and one take where I sort of added some dialogue uh, at the end. I put on that little tag at the end. Um, he said, this thing, this needs it. This needs an ending. It needs a button. So see if you can come up with something. And I just did on the fly. So I did that whole thing at the end of the scene where I say, you know, this is Alan Kincaid signing off from Hollywood. And, um, and they added that in there. But the whole experience was very fast. They shot that movie in like six months. And uh, so it was, uh, it was a nice to be a piece of it. I had no idea until, until about a week before the movie opened, I was in line waiting to get a table at a restaurant and there was a tap on my shoulder and I turned around and it's DiCaprio. And he was there. <laughs> and he, said, uh, he said, hey, dude, I just saw the trailer for the movie. 
and it looks great. The movie looks great. He said, and you're in the trailer. And I went, oh, that's fantastic. I was hoping, like every actor hopes that you're going to be in the trailer. Like they'll show a piece of you in the trailer. When you work on a film, you know, it's fun to, you know, be in the movie theater and you see yourself and you know that you made it in the movie. So I said, I said, oh, that's great. I said, I said, I'm, I'm still in the movie, I guess. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. He said, you are the trailer. And then the trailer came out the next day and I was all over the trailer. So I thought, and that's the, the bulk of my scene from the film is in the trailer. So that was, uh, that was a, a, a nice experience. But I didn't know at what point my scene from the film fit into the movie because I didn't read the script. Uh, I wanted to be surprised. I wanted to, I wanted to do my scene as a standalone piece. I didn't know where it was going to fit into the movie. I didn't know it was the opening scene. So when I went to the premiere at the Chinese theater here in Hollywood, and I sat down with my popcorn, and the first thing that you see is, you know, me in black and white with, uh, with Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio. And That's I thought... That's so cool. That it was an amazing crazy. feeling. That's insane, yeah. Yeah, I never, I mean... It never ceases to be cool for me. That's the, that's that's what I love. I mean, I I'm, I never I never stop. Uh, the the joy of being able to do this and uh, the love of it is is it's still fun for me. So uh, you know, I was like a kid. I was like a little kid. You know, seeing myself up on the big screen with two of the biggest movie stars in the world, and probably my favorite story from that day when in between takes. And, you know, DiCaprio was uh, telling me, or uh, uh, Tarantino was asking me a, a, a question about what it was like to work with Peter Falk on Columbo years ago. And, uh, you know, and we were just kind of shooting the breeze. And then at one point, Brad Pitt says, uh, he said, I know I've seen you in a million things. Um, he said, have we ever worked together before? And I said, well, you probably don't remember this, but you and I were on an episode of, of Dallas together. Dallas was an old nighttime soap opera in the States in, you know, the 1980s. It was a big, big deal. And so he's like, because Brad Pitt, as a 19-year-old kid, I think, did the last three episodes of Dallas. So all of a sudden, you know, DiCaprio says to me, did you ever do an episode of this? And I said, yeah. And I said, did you ever do an episode of that? He said, yeah. And all of a sudden, I was just talking to two journeyman character actors uh, that just happened to be extraordinarily gifted and, you know, won the genetic lottery and, and happened to be gigantic blockbuster movie stars. But in that moment, I was just talking to two cats that, you know, that uh, were just, that, that started out as working actors, just like I did. So it, it, it was a nice feeling. But Tarantino was great. He was a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun to work with. Mm. Yeah. But back to what you said there about everyone starts somewhere. Yeah. So, and yeah. anyone who would be looking to get into acting, what advice do you have? Uh, study, study, study. Find the best teacher you can. Uh, immerse yourself in, uh, you know, st st when I say study, I mean read plays, uh, read film scripts, find great acting teachers, uh, study the great actors on film. For me, as a kid growing up, my acting heroes were Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall and Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro and Meryl Streep. And I mean, you know, going back to the 30s and 40s in the golden age of film, um, Montgomery Clift and, uh, you know, James Dean, Marlon Brando. But for me, the great films, the greatest American era in American cinema was uh, was the 1970s. Gene Hackman. I mean, he's he's the you know he's the best there ever was. Picture of Gene Wilder in there too. He was an extraordinary actor. Uh, also, he was in um, uh, he was in Bonnie and Clyde with Gene Hackman. But Gene Hackman was a guy that didn't really his film career didn't really kickstart until he was in his mid thirties. So um, you know he and I share that in common. I mean you know we didn't he he really took off when he was in his thirties. But that's my advice to any young actor is you know is Find a great acting teacher, study, do theater, um, and, you know, just work your ass off. Don't try to get famous. Don't try to be famous. Do it for the love of the work and for the fun of the work. Um, you know, everybody wants to be famous these days. Uh, it's not about that. For me, it's, it's just about doing great work, entertaining, 
uh, having fun. And sometimes the perks are nice. Sometimes you get to, you know, I've been lucky enough to have done movies in Turkey and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and two movies in Thailand. You get to travel. Uh, that's the perks. But uh, for me, I just love to tell stories. So if you're an actor, if you're if you're an aspiring actor and you love you 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 have stories in you that you love to tell, uh, write them, put them up, put them up on stage, make a short film, make a short film with your cell phone. You know, um, I mean it's 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 so easy to make a movie these days. Do the work, create the work for yourself, and hopefully yeah, the good yeah. stuff will come. Uh, well, if that wasn't motivational. I don't know what what, what it is. <laughs> Uh, that was just, great, man. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, just just before we finish up now, I, I have um, two questions to ask, actually. Uh, the first one is, what's the craziest story you have? Obviously, you've been in so many projects, and then you have that Harrison Ford story, and, you know, having that, you must have uh, another big crazy story. And uh, after that... Too many crazy stories to count. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then after that, what I'm not going to share. <laughs> okay. Uh, and after that, what would you say is like a role you had alongside another actor where you were like, holy shit, and you were kind of starstruck? Sort of. Well, here, I will, I will tell you, I will answer both of those questions in the same answer with the same <laughs> actor. Uh, Robert okay. Duvall. Robert Duvall, who was in the Godfather films and Network and some of the greatest films of all time, one of the greatest actors of all time. Robert Duvall was uh, an acting hero of mine. And I was lucky enough to have been cast in a movie with him early in my career, I think 1994, uh, called The Stars Fell on Henrietta. And it was Robert Duvall and Aidan Quinn and Billy Bob Thornton and uh, Brian Denny. Billy Bob Thornton is a amazing 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 actor amazing actor i just uh, the next thing i have coming out is his uh show goliath uh he's a he's a dear old pal of mine he's amazing amazing writer amazing actor incredible talent obviously sling blade is what put him on the map as an actor but uh you know he i mean as as an actor as a writer as a director he's been around for a long time but uh incredible guy incredible I've talent there he is first seen him on fargo season one and yeah. he played oh jesus terrifying he played danger that that's oh, what he played oh yeah he embodied danger and he's evil phenomenal. he's phenomenal and 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 somebody he's sort of a uh in terms of a creative soul and a creative character uh some of that i that i really uh look to and and, and respect greatly he's a, he's he's a, a great musician a great writer uh it was a gas to be uh, directed by him in Goliath, uh, which is going to be coming out soon. So he's he's amazing. But Billy Bob was in this movie, Stars Fell on Henrietta, as a young actor. He was a young character actor. He hadn't really done much back then. But Duvall and I, uh, I was on this film, and I was probably 29 or something. This is before Air Force One, before things started to really click into gear for me. And... Uh, I, I remember the movie takes place in Texas in the 1930s, and Duvall is an old, uh, uh, an oil man. Uh, and I remember thinking, how do I make this character interesting? And I remember deciding that I was going to give him uh, tender mercies. Wow, look at that, look at that, look at that filmography right there. Kill a Mockingbird. It's now, Kill a Mockingbird. now, Open Range. Mercy. I mean, Jeez, the Apostle, man. which he wrote and directed. I mean, yeah. yeah, Tender Mercies, anybody watching, listening, you know, that's a master class right there for, for an actor. Um, but I decided to give my character, uh, he was going to be chewing gum and have a, a very pronounced limp. And I just, and I was talking like this, and I had a limp, <laughs> and I was chewing gum, and I was doing it, and I was doing everything I could do to make this character really interesting, because I was in Texas, and I'm one scene with Robert Duvall and I'm just like, and I'm so like, I'm, I walk up to him and I'm limping and I'm chewing gum and I'm doing all this shit. And the director pulled me aside after one take and he's like, dude, what the, what the fuck are you doing? And I said, said, I'm, I'm, I decided that, that Delbert Timms, 
my character's name. I decided that you know he was that he had a limp, that he that he uh, that he uh, injured his leg in the war, and uh, he's like, lose the limp, lose the chewing gum. You are trying to be interesting. You're trying too hard to be interesting. Robert Duvall is a master of stillness, and I mean he can he can say fifty words with raising an eyebrow. Mm. And and I'm trying to I was trying to be interesting. I was trying to uh, create a moment for myself on screen. Um, I was trying to make an impression, and I did. I made an impression on the director. He basically said, "Drop all the shit, drop all of the you know the limp and the chewing gum and all that." He said, "Just say the words." He said, "You're trying to be op- you're trying to be interesting opposite one of the most uh, complete and full and still." actors there is he said you're gonna look like a, you're gonna look like an asshole if you do all that stuff and I said you're right and at one point Duvall pulled me aside he said he said it was good advice right he said lose the chewing gum lose the limp you're gonna be just fine and I never forgot it um, you know I because he was somebody that I respected and um, and I, it's something that I to this day I, I try to remember uh, that less is more Mm-hmm. So, not exactly a crazy story, but it's a story that left an impression on me. And for somebody that uh, was so, uh, I, I was, I was so fond of him as an actor growing up. And maybe because I, you know, I grew up. I've seen the Godfather films, you know, a hundred times. So, you know, watching him and being on a set with him as a young kid was a thrill. So, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to impress my idol and, uh, you know, that was a mistake, but it worked out. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess we got to finish up eventually. So and to finish <laughs> off what's, what's coming next. What, what are you in next? Um, what look forward to seeing? Quarantine. And, uh, I did a pilot for, uh, Adam McKay, uh, who directed vice and, uh, Talladega Nights and Ron Burgundy and uh, oh, amazing directors, Step Brothers. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, so, that's brilliant. So, so yeah. we did a pilot for HBO uh, about the uh, about the late 1980s uh, Lakers basketball team with Magic Johnson, and uh, when Magic Johnson came on the team and uh, basically changed the game of basketball, and it's called it's called Showtime. We were supposed to start shooting in June. I am playing. Uh, I'm playing a legendary broadcaster named Chick Hearn. Uh, you can look him up. He was a real character. He was the broadcaster for the Lakers for uh, for 50 years, I think. And so we were supposed to start shooting in June because of the pandemic. We are so we're probably not going to go filming the series uh, until February. So that's what I had coming up. Um, but if you get a picture of Chick Hearn up there, you can see. I'm not allowed to show you a picture of what I look like as Chick Hearn. Oh, no, of course, yeah. But, is, that, uh, is that him? I don't think. I think I've gotten the name you, wrong. You, I said, oh. Yeah, you spelled it wrong. Chick, oh, oh, chick oh. like chick, like a like a chicken. Oh my god. Yeah, Sorry. Chick Hearn. Thomas is getting fired promptly. <laughs> so when you see him, you will see. Try to picture me. Uh, they gave oh, me yeah. an aesthetic nose. And a prosthetic chin, and a prosthetic ears, and a wig, and it completely. Oh yeah, changed. you you can kind of see the resemblance. That's, I mean, yeah. That's me, yeah. It's uncanny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's a good pick. So that's yeah. who, nice. That's who I play. Uh, the show is going to be called Showtime, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll start shooting. It's the same guy. There's a my favorite show on TV right now is called Succession on HBO. So it's the same creator, Adam McKay. But uh, we shot the pilot. Uh, I got to play Chick Hearn. I got to meet his family. I've gotten to meet several Lakers, and I'm a huge basketball fan. It also stars John C. Riley, uh, oh, yeah. who's amazing, and Jason Clark, who's an amazing uh, Australian actor, who's playing Jerry West, who's the iconic Lakers basketball player. Um, so that's that's uh, that's on hold. Uh, and if it does come out in the fall, I did a movie called Blonde. Uh, you play a very play unique a very- character in that. What's that? You play a very unique character in that. In Blonde? Yeah. Yes. I'm reading it here. Yeah. I was the president's, uh, let's call him facilitator. 
But yeah, that's oh yeah, Ana de Armas plays Marilyn Monroe, and uh, and my role, my character's name is President's Pimp, and that's all I can. <laughs> now, I, I love that. I'm looking forward to seeing this. Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be it's an amazing cast. Uh, Adrian Brody, Bobby Cannavale, uh, incredible, credible cast. It was directed by uh, Andrew Dominic who directed one of my favorite films, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. And he also did, and he also did uh, Killing Them Softly with uh, Brad Pitt. So I think, I think it's probably coming out in the fall, hopefully, who knows? Who knows if we'll ever get to sit in a fucking movie theater ever again, but hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I think Tenet, That's Tenet's coming out in cinemas over here. Which, oh, Tenet is? Yeah. Uh, oh, great. Bill and Ted 3 is coming out in cinemas as well. I'm not too sure about that, but... I think it is. Tenet is definitely. I saw a promotion from yeah, Plex, are, the uh, cinema yeah. over here. They're selling tickets already for it. Yeah. Which is. Good. I think. I think it's. I don't know. I mean, it's good in some places. Mm. Still have low. A lot of. Low but like for us, obviously, better. we're not going to be able to go to the cinema for ages now, like, because we're back yeah. in quarantine. Yeah. Our, guys... our county of Offaly, Leash, and then Kildare. Yeah, we we explained quarantine. that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to take a picture of you guys. <laughs> Why not pose for it at least? There you go. <laughs> Hang on, one more time. All right. <laughs> can, can, I, can I post that, fellas? Oh of yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> Good. <laughs> right. right. Well, um, so we'll finish. I love talking to you guys. An absolute pleasure. All day. So, if you ever want to do this again, awesome. oh, a hundred percent, man. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Oh, one hundred percent. If I ever, if I ever get, if 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 uh, if I ever get my ass back over there, I'll look you guys up. Oh yeah, we should. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely we'll do something if you come over here. I'd love it. Uh, right. Right. Well, so, uh, thank you so watching, much listening. for coming on as well. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Thank you, fellas. Hey, don't forget. Where am I? Wear the damn mask. Wear the damn Wear mask. mask. Stay safe. Uh, On don't top be... of wearing your mask, uh, make sure you like and subscribe <laughs> and comment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell your grandma about the podcast. Uh, I will. Take handy. And don't take be handy. Don't be a mask hole. Nice. Well, nice. That's nice. It. See what Love I did it. there? And we did, it. yeah. <laughs> take your handy. Have a good Look. day.